Hi. Um, I want to tell a story about DOJ's involvement with this survey. Um, and I think the story has some good insight for what we want to do in the future. Uh, as probably most of you know, uh, criminology has been uh, trying to do good longitudinal studies of, of crime for a long, long time. The work goes back to the 1940s. Uh, uh, that's not Okay. <laughs> <laughs> these, work, these studies go back to the 1940s. A lot of them used official data, a lot of them used self-report data. But in general, they were they had some commonalities. First of all, they were relatively small. It's only got an end size of around 500. Generally, the samples were with high-risk youth and not with the general population of people. Um, and, they, and they always collected relatively limited amount of data because they didn't have the wherewithal to collect everything that the NLS Y97 could collect. So what happened in the mid-1980s, there was a National Academy of Sciences panel that took a look at criminal careers, uh, led by Al Bloomstein and others. And they came out with a book that started promoting the idea of criminal careers and what we should look at. And just around that time, people got interested in doing more funding of that, which is always the key. The story of DOJ has to do with funding. And so the, the National Academy book came out in the late 1980s. The NLSY design was starting to happen in the early 1990s. And people at DOJ, I wasn't there at the time, but I was working with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Police Prevention, OGJDP, uh, with people there uh, doing other research. And a number of us got together and said, we should find out a way of how to use the new NLSY to do this perfect longitudinal study on the criminal careers of children. Um, <laughs> Because well, and what we talked about, and I remember going into the director's office at the time and describing it to somebody who wasn't really research driven, um, because you know, OJP is primarily a programs office where they fund programs in the, in the country that don't do research. And I remember the, the, the you might mention the crime lady. The crime lady was Barbara Allen Hagen, um, and Barbara, Barbara and I were talking to the director, and we used the analogy of a space shuttle. That NLSY was the space shuttle. That we couldn't afford to build a space shuttle, but we can afford we can afford to put a, a scientific experiment into the payload, and that worked. That, that got the idea. So what what we not just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, nothing's changed. Um, so so what what when we made the case, we said in this, this shows we said how much is going to be collected here? Data that no prior longitudinal study of kids was ever able to collect. I mean, let's face it, the amount of money spent on this was far greater than any other study that was done. And it had the national representation that no other study had. So what, what DOJ did, what OGJP did, again, as a juvenile part of, of DOJ, or DOJ um, they funded a series of questions to be added to the NLS Y97. And these questions had to do with self-reported delinquent behavior, which is what um, was trying to what was done in the past with very small samples, but it also then asked them about their justice system involvement. Not only what crimes did you do, but then what crimes were you arrested for, and what crimes did you go to? In, were you incarcerated for? To get an extended understanding of ju not just their behavior, but what this justice system saw, which are obviously very different. And most studies show that you know a lot of people, like most of you in the room, did crimes. <laughs> And you weren't arrested for it, but if somebody were standing there, you'd have been arrested for it. Um, and so it's, it was nice to get that, 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 that combination together. So it, it went well. And for the first seven waves of this study, things went well um, for this. They were collected on, all of, on, 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 the, on the measures, and then something happened. And I, maybe we could figure out the reason for this. But something happened in wave seven where the funding, I think, stopped. The OGNP funding stopped. And I, I think part of the reason was Barbara was gone at the time. Um, and also, this was the Office of Juvenile Justice and Prevention. And by the seventh wave, all the our participants were outside the juvenile years. So the decision made, why should OGNP fund this when these kids are all adults now? <sighs> a, ter <laughs> a terrible decision yeah. made because we had no idea then what these kids did on in later life. Now, they are still being collected. But, the, but as you probably know, that the, the, the only data, the only crime data that are being collected now are on those kids who are who are arrested before the age of 17. So that relatively small 
proportion that were arrested, and then a control sample, a relatively small sample, which really blows up the confidence intervals and it makes it very, very, very hard to do. So the story is that this, we could sell this idea, but selling it was not enough. Somebody had to shepherd this thing throughout its life course, and that's what was lost. That's what needed to be done, and it needed to be, I mean, need to be set up within the organization that this is a permanent commitment for all the reasons and make some commitment to that on paper. Because it was that every year you had to go and fight for the money. And I believe it was something like $150,000 or some relatively small amount of money. But it was lost. So the, the lesson from this is that if we ever do this again, we need to figure out some way of institutionalizing it more, especially when the administrators within justice and without other agencies wane and have in their interest in research and, and, the, and the need for these data. So, so, so with that said, I mean, there, there was a lot of work done on, on the on the NLSY 97 data, the crime part of it. I mean, there have been lots of important studies, studies uh, published. It's still being published. BGS in the last several years funded NORC to go into the NLSY and pull out the crime data and to, and to create a, a parallel database uh, using NLSY data that it's more easily usable by criminologists. Um, because honestly, criminologists don't have the same uh, data manipulation skills as economists do. I mean, it's, that's pretty much true, you know. Uh, and so we need to make it easier for them. So we created this file to make it easier for them. So they could go through and easily analyze the, the flow of delinquency uh, reports on every month in the, in the kid's life, and then they could tie it back to the full breadth of the NLSY data. So the story here is that this space shuttle needs to be supported. It needs to be supported continuously by some advocates in the organization, but also by paper. So make sure this all flows. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to say, and that was brought up this morning, there are all these potentials for using the NLSY data, using administrative data, linking with administrative data. Um, I, I, I agree completely with what was said earlier that, that you can't replace the, 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 na, na, the nature of the data we get out of the NLSY. No ministry of data sets is going to get you the time of day of sex, right? Um, or all, all the other things. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's tapes everywhere. <laughs> um, but there are potentials for linking, and one we've talked about several times over the last several years, and I think it's getting close to being a possibility. Uh, is linking the NLSY data with the rap sheet information. Um, rap sheets, as you all know, they, they, every state participates in the national rap sheet system. Um, VGS in the last several years has developed a technology which will enable, it enables us to go in and request a rap sheet on any persons or any 100,000 persons and, and put, put an ID number into the system and within six seconds we get back that rap sheet and within a week or two uh, putting all the data together, we can pass it through a, uh, through a, a system we had to standardize the rap sheets because every state uses different codes and then all the stuff. We have software now that goes and reads all the codes and pushes out a database using common codes across all the states to look at the criminal careers, officially recognized criminal careers of people. Uh, we've, we've, done, we've done studies looking at uh, people released from prison, we have people who are on federal probation. We can do it for the analyst one. Technically, we can do it for this way. Politically, and PII-wise, and IRB-wise, it's going to be a struggle, um, um, given that. But the advantages of making it happen are worth the struggle. And so all we need to do, technically, to make this work is to figure out what the fingerprint ID numbers are for all the people in the NLS why not? <laughs> <laughs> Which you can do. I mean, you know, cops do this all the time. If you're stopped, if you're stopped by a cop, they come up and they look at your, your driver's license, and they see your name and your birthday, and they type that into their computer in their car, and within relatively few six seconds, they get a national rap sheet on you that says whether or not you've been arrested, and if there are any wants and warrants on you, or, any, or if your car's been stolen or that stuff, it's all there. And they can do it based on the name and the birthday. Um, to run the way we have to do that, we have to take that name and birthday and pull out of, out of that sheet the FBI ID number, uh, which everybody who's ever been arrested has, and then run those numbers into the system. So it's technically possible. Um, now, 
All the other things around that are monumental. We have to figure out the way it would, but it's worth the trial. Because we can then see, just from the juvenile side of things, we, just look at, we know what's the life, what happened to these kids' lives after they became adults. We have some of that information now from the analyst one and seven, but we could get it, and we could get it every year. Because once you have the ID numbers, it's relatively expensive to run them again and again and again. The only thing that the technology problem is is you're putting a burden on the system, they say. Which is not really true, because they run like a couple million rap sheets a month, so it's putting 10,000 is not going to put a blip on the system. Um, <laughs> but it can be done. So I would like to be, I would like to start talking to people about how we can do this. And then talking to the FBI, I got, got getting permission to do this. And there must be all kinds of constraints that you have on doing this. But it's a possibility that would enhance the data in our work, on our work with the data. Even though the collection in the NLSI has really been limited about this future crime stuff, even though the rap sheet data. So there are partnerships that can be developed like this to go on to the future to work with the data. Hopefully when the new, co new cohorts are designed, DOJ will be at the table putting funding in for this and making sure that, that, that it doesn't go away in five years or seven years like it did in the past. And that's what the missions of people in DOJ who care about is need to figure out a way of doing. And I mean, maybe uh, in the future it might be better for the funding to come from BJS than from OJP, because BJS has a larger focus on the crime than just juvenile stuff. But um, at the time, JJ had the money, and BJS didn't, so that's where I was going. Thanks.